Royal Agricultural Society of New South Wales are pleased to have the support of both AWI and ZFI at today's AgriChats activation. AWI is a not-for-profit enterprise that conducts research, development and marketing along the worldwide supply chain for Australian wool on behalf of about 60,000 wool growers that help fund the company. Thank you for allowing us to use the technology within the Sheep Pavilion today. Secondly, ZFI are a technology company based in Wagga Wagga, New South Wales, that offer innovative solutions for on-farm connectivity. Their ruggedised long-range Wi-Fi products provide reliable last-mile connectivity to support voice, video and internet right across the farm. Good afternoon and welcome to AgriChats. My name is Tim Green and it is my pleasure to be moderating today's AgriChats session. AgriChats is a one hour panel based discussion aiming to generate discussion on a topic pertinent to rural and regional New South Wales whilst raising awareness on such an important topic to the general public. Firstly, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather today the Wan Gaal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Over the last four years, AgriChats has been led by the Royal Agricultural Society Youth Group, a committee driven to promote agriculture through engaging urban and non-urban audiences at the Sydney Royal Easter Show. The RAS Youth Group is comprised of passionate young professionals that aim to educate, entertain and engage youth through RAS programs, events and competitions. Today's topic will focus on domestic food production in Australia. Australian farmers produce more food than Australians consume, exporting around 70% of the total agricultural output. Australia ranks among the most food secure nations globally, alongside Canada, Germany and France, importing only a little over 10% of our food and beverages. The panel will explore the role Australian farmers play and how they influence agriculture and the impact of global trends and events on our domestic food security. So please allow me to introduce our panel. On my far right is Sam Johnston. Sam can be described as an agricultural enthusiast and young industry trailblazer who has one aim, to showcase where Australian food and fibre comes from, who makes it and how it's made. He has a strong rural background, born and bred west of Forbes, New South Wales. His passion is to be the link between producer and consumer, city and bush, and does his best to promote Australia's agricultural industry and its primary producers wherever he goes. After finishing his Bachelor of Agricultural Economics at the University of Sydney, Sam joined the Mears and Associates Sydney team as a rural property sales and marketing specialist, where he worked for a three year period. More recently, Sam has begun to transition back towards regional New South Wales and his hometown of Forbes in order to gain more on-farm and grassroots agricultural experience. Overall, he is a strong advocate for the agricultural sector and its farmers, as seen by his efforts as the co-founder 
of the social media organisation and movement, hashtag thank a farmer for your next meal, as well as being named a 2019 RAS New South Wales Rural Achiever and Evoke Ag 2020 Future Young Leader. Please make Sam feel welcome. Our next panellist is Holly Bailey. Holly is currently the Policy Manager for Agriculture at Woolworths Group. Holly has worked across a diverse range of fields within the agricultural sector. She completed her Bachelor of Agricultural Science at Charles Sturt University in 2011 and moved into an animal health sales role before working in ag-related media and policy roles more broadly. Prior to Woolworths, Holly was the Agricultural Advisor for the then New South Wales Minister for Primary Industries, the Honourable Niall Blair. She has been active in farming organisations including New South Wales Farmers Association and National Farmers Federation. Whatever role she is in, Holly is driven to better engage and communicate with the public on the realities of food production and what it takes to get a product from paddock to plate. Welcome, Holly. Our third panellist is Daryl Nichols. Daryl Nichols is an innovator and impact entrepreneur who is the co-founder of Australia's largest council-powered community and sustainability campaign, the Garage Sale Trail. He is also a co-founder of the recently launched Grow It Local initiative, Your Local Grow Community. Daryl has received several high-profile awards and accolades, including an International Green Award in London, Banksia Award for Citizenship and Community Leadership, a Green Globe Award, Green Marketing of the Year, a Community Contribution of the Year Award. Daryl has also been invited to and presented at Number 10 Downing Street to the Royal Household at St James Palace, Clarence House, and as a part of the TED Global Young Innovators Talent Search. Welcome, Daryl. Our final panellist is Amelia Shaw. Amelia Shaw is Policy Manager for Grain Growers Limited, managing the drought, agribusiness and trade portfolios. Amelia currently holds director roles on the Future Farmers Network, YMCA of Brisbane and Australia's boards. Amelia has significant experience in strategy development, marketing and partnerships, as well as a comprehensive knowledge of the agricultural sector. Amelia is passionate about promoting young voices and ensuring young people are represented in conversations about the future of Australian agriculture. Welcome, Amelia. <laughs> Just a quick reminder that all of our audience members today are also invited to participate in the discussion. Uh, I'll open the, the board up for questions once we get towards the end. Please wait until the mic comes you, to you before asking your question. If you'd like to share your views and any photos of today's event, please put them on social media using the hashtag AgriChats and hashtag YouthInAg. Right, I have had enough of listening to my own voice and I'm sure all of you out there are thinking the exact same thing. So we're going to jump straight into it by throwing the first of our questions to our panellists. So I'd like to hear from at least one of them about what domestic food production means to them and why it is so important to our country. I suppose from my perspective, so working uh, in the grains industry, um, I'm pretty sure most of you have eaten a grain product um, today and hopefully it's come from Australia. Um, Aussies are fabulous at producing food and by the look of our audience we've got a number of you who come from regional Australia and understand the passion and the talent um, that goes into producing Australian food for our own consumption but also internationally with over 70% of um, agricultural products whether they're food or fibre being exported to foreign markets so I think something to be proud of and that's why it's really important not only for regional Australia but the Australian economy as well particularly in a COVID world we're looking for ways to ensure that we bounce back and that we continue to um, fuel the Australian economy and ways in doing that is through ag we've seen 
a lot of passion for ensuring that people are buying local during COVID, and I think um, moving forward, domestic production is going to be a continuous point of discussion, um, in not only in agriculture but more broadly. I think I think also from a from a Woolworths perspective, um, the luck, the great thing is is that when you go to your supermarkets, which um, 26 million people do every single week. Um, you know that the products that you are buying are Australian and you know where they're coming from, who is growing them, and more and more our farmers are telling that story um, to our customers every day. So I think we almost take for granted that our products, as Milia said, you know, can be, can be from just down the road. Um, and I think through COVID we um, saw that as, as so important because um, whereas some countries, you know, rely on imports, um, whereas, whereas we, we don't. We are very good at what we do and, and so good that, yeah, we export 70% of what we produce. Fantastic. And I think from the gentleman on that topic? Uh, yeah, it's just on uh, what Holly was saying. It's uh, great to see that uh, farmers and primary producers uh, within Australia are growing more proud um, and more able to have a bit of a voice. Um, it's great to see uh, mainstream media as well as social media um, there's a lot more positive story out there about farmers, a lot more, you know, uh, there's a bit more uh, personality and, you know, people are able to connect a little bit more with their food and fibre and where it comes from. Uh, but in saying that, there's still a long way to go uh, and it's great to see uh, those farmers and those primary producers proud of what they do on farm um, because, it, you know, it's something to be proud of. Thanks, Sam. I think, we'll, uh, I think we've covered off really well there about where domestic food production's at at the moment and its importance. So I'd like to hear from our panel members today, what industries and sectors do you believe are going to continue to grow in Australia in terms of our domestic production? I think, Tim, if we look at, uh, if we go slightly more micro scale and go down to the sort of the local context, one of the things we saw happen uh, throughout COVID as part of the world sort of falling to pieces was this really uh, major surge in interest in people uh, w wanting to grow food themselves. And, and that was for a variety of reasons. That was, you know, we saw our supermarket shelves stripped of stock. Uh, we saw, um, we all s suffered in some way, shape or form challenges around COVID and the mental health um, and wellbeing issues that that presented to us. And the simple practice of planting a seed and growing something in your own home, whether it's on a balcony, a windowsill in a courtyard, or perhaps on the verge, really um, seem to help people through that difficult time. And by way of numbers, we saw a, a, a jump in participation in growing food at home from about 52% uh, of Australian households, representing somewhere around, I think, about 13 million Australians, uh, to about 72 percent so r absolutely radical surge a and part of what that has done is to help familiarize people with how difficult it is to grow food a and the level of respect and admiration we need to have for all the primary producers that are, that are bringing that food to us and into our homes every single day so i think we're going to we're going to see that trend continue um, and, and and the other positive spin that has come from that is this increased appreciation for food. When you grow your own food, you, you know it's so difficult to do, you have much greater respect for it. And so you generally waste less. And as a nation um, that has a big food waste problem, that's a really good win for all of us. Yeah, I am, um, just while you're on that, Daryl and I were having a bit of a chat before, uh, we hadn't met each other before, and we were just discussing um, how much, you know, it, how hard it is actually to grow f food. And, uh, I was talking to him about the Woolworths Discovery Garden. I'm not sure if any of you guys out there in the audience have had a crack, but my carrots were absolutely atrocious. They were about, I think they were about half an inch long and bent, and uh, yeah, I wouldn't cut it as a veggie farmer. Um, but it, it just goes out there to show how, how hard it actually is, and, and you know, um, it, it, it really did increase my you know, value for farmers and, and people that are doing that day in, day, day, in, day out. So, yeah. And just to add to that, I think the exciting thing is is that our farmers are innovating all of the time. So, Tim, you asked about, you know, what areas will be growing, what sort of sectors will be growing. I think, um, you know, you look at the baby cucumber. Who has uh, tasted a baby cucumber? Yeah, delicious, right? Because before the baby cucumber came along, we just had the big cucumber. And all you could do with that was cut it up and put it in salads. So what our growers are doing is they're taking the everyday product and actually making it 
um, more convenient, which is a huge trend we see in supermarkets. Um, another one that um, I'm very pleased to see is the humble egg. Um, I don't know if you've ever tried to take an egg to work and put it in the microwave, um, mixed results with a microwave, egg in the microwave. Um, so one of our egg partners, Sunny Queen, based in Queensland, they came to us and said, look, we've actually got this technology that will um, we'll be able to deliver um, hard-boiled eggs, all ready to go, just pop them in your mouth, um, to the supermarket with really long shelf life. So again, an egg, which is, you know, we've always had eggs on shelf, but our suppliers and our farmers are innovating and actually making more of that, that raw product, and they are value adding. Um, and that, that is the exciting space. And I suppose the other thing, like I work for a grains industry, I represent grain farmers and yet I'm uh, a celiac and I'm allergic to gluten, so I don't know how I managed to get past the interview stage, but there's really amazing stuff that's happening in biotech. Um, there's heaps of research going on in terms of ways to uh, de develop wheat crops that remove that gluten um, strain so that we can have celiacs enjoying a lovely um, slice of bread from Woolies um, that isn't uh, gluten free and you can bang it and it's probably the same texture as this table in front of me. So there's some epic research that's going on in terms of dealing with health concerns as well. Another area of growth that I suppose is not necessarily looking at Australian consumers, but also internationally. We've got a global um, population that's growing, but with that growth, they're becoming more wealthy. And as we see through every country in the world, with incomes rising, so does people's hunger for red meat and animal protein. And from a selfishly from a grains industry, that's a great opportunity for anyone who grows wheat and barley who want to sell that into those food production systems to help mate fat chickens and fat cows. So that's another area that I think is going to be particularly of interest for Australia moving forward um, as we've got our close Asian neighbours as they're becoming a bit more wealthy as well. Thanks very much for that. I think that was a really good cover off of our larger industries and the introduction of these booming new growing at home uh, sectors of growth. So my question then to the panellists, if we're seeing all of this growth in so many different areas, how sustainable is that going to be moving into the future? Uh, Daryl, I'd like to throw to you first. Do you think it's sustainable for people to be growing their own food at home moving into the future? Well, I guess it starts with what, you know, how you define sustainability. And I think probably for the average family, um, you're never going to grow as much food as you need to consume. Um, so that's probably a, a red flag. But I think that it's, it's, it's much, much more than that. And it's as, as simple as uh, getting your fingernails into the dirt, tickling the worms, and sort of having that connection with nature and just logging off and slowing down and that's probably the much more powerful I think benefit that we can all accrue from um, growing food at home a and possibly then how that informs our decisions when we go to the supermarket when we go to Woolies or when we go to the farmers market and, and have those conversations um, about the provenance of the food and like by way of example can I get a hand here for everyone of everyone um, who eats vegetables or plants or produce in some way shape or form so pretty much everyone. And, you know, there's a statistic, I think, that says that Australia has the fastest vegetarian growing nation or population in the world. But we all eat plants anyway. And, and possibly, for me, the big difference is the stuff you grow you, yourself or you buy from the farmer down at the farmer's markets or have a better appreciation for where it came from. It just tastes better. And, and I would imagine, Holly, like, we're going to see an increase in um, organic consumption into the future, would you say? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, so in our stores at the moment, sort of organic fruit and veg would make up about 3% of the fruit and veg. Um, our goal is to be um, more like 5%. Um, but uh, unfortunately, um, demand outstrips supply at this stage. So it's about how we can encourage different ways of farming um, we actually have an organic growth fund. We're trying to, you know, we're giving grants and funds to organic growers to say, hey, we're here to support you because this is a growing industry um, and we want to see, you know, more, more of it. But, yeah, but on that with sustainability, it's, um, it's one of the top, top two, top three um, factors that our customers are looking for more and more. You know, if you think of Gen Z, so that's the six-year-olds to 24-year-olds, they are our next decade of shoppers, right? I know, six-year-olds, it's, it's happening. Um, <laughs> And so what we know is that when they shop now at the other uh, one end and as they keep, you know, moving through, 
they will be so more, much more interested in the value of that product. Not, not value as in, as in money-wise, but in how it was made, who made it, the sustainability metric behind it, because sustainability is so different depending on what, on what you're talking about. It could be animal welfare, it could be soil health, it could be um, reducing um, chemical use, it could be a whole range of things. So sustainability means something different all the time, but we know that our customers are very interested in it um, and very keen to learn more and more. Thank you. I'd like to throw it over to you, Sam, representing the family farm. How do you think family farms are going to cope moving into the future in this growth of domestic production in terms of their sustainability? Is it sustainable for the family farm to continue? Well, um, one thing that I've probably come across uh, working in rural property and sales uh, over the last two or three years, family farmers have actually been at the front um, of, the, of the buyers and it's, it's really great to see. Um, I thought when I was getting into the industry in 2017 that all the buyers would be internationals and we'd be selling all our land to overseas purchases. Um, and it was so good to see that there was family, you know, successful farming families buying these places and, and they're big places. So um, to, to meet the, you know, sustainability side of the, the family farm, I think there's, you know, scope to do it. Um, there's a lot of you know, my generation now returning to the farm and, 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 and men and women younger than me returning to the farm, which we might not have seen there for a 10-year period. So it's really good to see that, you know, ag is, is being seen as an, an interesting career path now, whereas, you know, when I was going through school, I had a lot of people that were talked out about <coughs> or talked out of getting into agriculture because of, you know, you're going to get either burnt out, you get a, have a drought, or you're going to get flooded. So... Um, Whilst we've seen a lot of that in the last few years, it, it, it is, um, you know, becoming quite a, a sustainable industry. Um, and one of the other things on sustainability, which is probably not that related with your question, but what the guys over there were talking about before, um, I read a statistic earlier today that we, um, in Australia, we actually waste um, 7.3 million tonnes of food each year, um, which, if you break that down to a person-by-person -person basis, is 300 kilos. So if um, each one of this room, each person here at this chat is 300 kilos, you think about how much, how much weight we're throwing out in food. That's one in five shopping bags. Um, and, and that whole thing about everyone's talking about we need to produce X amount of food by 2030 and 2050. Um, the reality is we're, we're probably producing a, a good amount of food, but we've got to look down the line of how much we're actually throwing out. I also read another statistic that throwing out one full burger um, the amount of, you know, water that went into that from, from way to go, so from farm transport to get it on the shelf was the same as having an uh, hour and a half shower. So if one burger is an hour and a half in the shower's worth of water, like that, that's a pretty eye-opening statistic to me. So, um, you know, for you guys out there who, you know, might not eat a, a full burger or, and throw a full thing out, it's, you know, it, it all adds up, so... Fantastic. Thanks, Sam. Amelia, do you have anything to add in terms of the grain sector and what they're working towards in terms of sustainability? Yeah, definitely. So Grain Growers is an organisation really proud to be leading the grain sustainability framework. So some people might be familiar with the beef industry putting out the statement of being carbon neutral by 2030. Um, 2030, 2050? Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but the grains industry is currently going through a similar process. And to Holly's point of what is sustainability, is it from an environmental point of view? Is it the economics? Is it the human side of sustainability? The grains industry has whittled it down to a three key pillars. Um, and it comes back to that environmental sustainability. Are we being responsible stewards for the land on which we farm in Australia? Um, but also, are we being safe employers and our people on farm feeling safe. Agriculture has astounding statistics with deaths on, and injuries on farm. So something that the grains industry really wants to ensure that that doesn't happen anymore um, and put in measures in place to ensure that people feel safe, not only from a work health and safety, but also ensuring that there's diversity on farm as well. And the final thing is, I suppose, consumer confidence. Um, we all go to Woolies or the other big brands and look at packaging and want to understand that is it correct what it says on the on the packaging do we use the right chemicals in the way that they should be used and we do have really amazing regulators in Australia that make sure that we have safe food not only for Aussies but those that consume our food overseas so 
those three pillars have really leading us to champion and really give an opportunity for grain farmers to tell their story through those areas because we're finding those three pillars really resonate with someone who might live in Darlinghurst in Sydney, but it also connects with someone who might live in Wagga as well. Thanks very much for that. Uh, I'd like to throw it back over now to Holly and Daryl because you both touched uh, a little bit before on, on where you see the future of consumer behaviour going. So, Daryl, you've been talking about growing stuff at home um, and doing more and more of it yourself. Do you think this is going to continue to change and improve in the future and will that change how consumers are interacting at their, wherever their large supermarket is? I think that possibly yes, Tim. Um, already we're seeing, uh, although we're only a very small network, uh, the, an urban agriculture network, about 10, 12,000 members across Australia, um, already we're seeing uh, people connecting every day to uh, swap herbs, trade uh, produce, share their eggs, what have, what have you. And I think it, you know, it goes back to a simple fact that sometimes when you go to the supermarket, you might be say, say I'm cooking a, a lamb roast for my family on the weekend and they're coming around, but I don't need a whole pack of rosemary. I just need five or six sprigs. And if I know that um, old Marlow down the road has a rosemary bush out the front that I can just go and grab some from and maybe he can grab some of my um, rocket or whatever is growing in our patch, then that's a pretty decent exchange too. And we're seeing this sort of happen right across the country. And it's just, I guess, the next iteration of we've had paddock to plate for so long. And I really think if you fast forward 10 years, you'll just have patch to plate. We, we've started working with some of the um, some really amazing restaurants and chefs across the country. Um, uh, the Three Blue Ducks here in Sydney and up and down the East Coast and Rodney Dunn at the Agrarian Kitchen in Tassie and they're, they're, they're effectively um, using the platform to crowd farm produce from their local community to put on their menu. And it's, it's not just the fact that you know that it's grown with love, as it is in most cases um, in regional Australia, but they can say, oh, you know, it's, um, it's Tomo's Tomatoes on the menu this week and it gives it a little bit of a sort of a community good vibe. And, and just a civic pride element, which is, which kind of works for everyone. Yeah, and um, what we're saying more and more is that we're all we're all uh, a share of stomach. It's not so much just you know the supermarkets and local markets. It's everything in between, which is exactly what Daryl was saying, which is actually really fun, really fun to look at. Um, but in terms of broader trends and where um, what we are seeing in supermarkets. Trends are a funny thing, you know, there are trends no matter what, trends are different for every family, for every sort of sector of the society, right? So um, we know that generally, um, you know, convenience is a huge factor. Um, everything from ready-made ready meals to part-made meals. You may even see uh, things like cauliflower rice. Who would have thought cauliflower could be sexy? It's now been made into something much more convenient. So the convenient factor is definitely skyrocketing. But to, to Daryl's point, the, the local... Um, local pool is very, very strong. And especially through COVID, we saw this massive increase in our customers looking for and searching for Australian. So Australian products um, have skyrocketed, not because they weren't on the shelf, but because they've always been on the shelf, but it's that people are actually seeking them out. Um, and that's been really exciting. And we've actually um, added extra labels to make it even more clear, um, you know, how much of our store is actually Australian. And on the local sourcing piece, we, um, it's actually a really nice program that, we're, that we've got. It's called the Local Sourcing Program. And so we actually um, focus on eggs and milk and often honey. And we source locally, so very local, um, you know, wherever we can. Most recently, we, we brought on a, a family, um, the McMillans from um, Bega Valley Eggs. So Bega, I don't know who are the showgirls is from Bega. No one? Oh, Margaret. Good, Margaret. Good. Um, so, Vega Valley Eggs, they lost two-thirds of their chickens through fires. Um, we partnered with them and they started selling their eggs in three of our stores. They're now in seven of our stores. So, we actually partnered with six local egg suppliers in New South Wales alone and many, many more um, in, in Australia more widely. So, that is a big part of, um, of Woolies and I think sometimes Woolies is, is perhaps seen as a, you know, too big to, to, to source and to, and to supply locally. but we're very, very much more looking into that because it's important and our customers are asking for it and our suppliers are, you know, without our Australian suppliers, we're not, we haven't got a business. So we're, we're really excited about supporting that. Thank you. 
Either of you two have comments on changing consumer trends? Yeah, well, I am, I'm actually quite interested in consumer trends. Um, a lot of people think that just because they're a producer, they're not a consumer. We're, we wear both hats, um, being farmers. Uh, and one of the things that astounds me is the, um, the lack of information still in shopping centres you know, across, the, across the board. Um, I'll go into a shopping centre and, and from someone as, um, with a background like mine that you know, grew up on a farm, lives day-to-day -day life in the agriculture industry, I'd love to be able to make a more informed purchasing decision um, when I'm standing in front of the milk cabinet. I'd love to know why I should pay 50 cents a litre more for X than I would be for brand Y. So um, whilst that you know, has shifted a lot um, with the introduction of social media and, and you know, our technology, I still think there's a he heap of um, room to improve there and I think if someone with my background um, doesn't understand why I should be paying more for product X, um, then how is someone that you know, isn't involved in it in a day-to-day -day basis? And I think it goes back to um, what Daryl said before, it's um, food that you grow yourself, it, it, it tastes great and food that, you know, that I bought from Tim up the road, it's, it, it, there's a bit more of a personal story behind it and whilst putting every single consumer in the same basket is never going to get you anywhere. There is definitely um, an increasing amount of people within Australia wanting to know where the food and fibre came from, um, who made and how it was made. So if we can come up with um, you know, an improved method to do that, I'd love to just be able to go up to a, um, a steak or a um, bottle of milk and go bang, that was you know, grown by Tim's family at Nimitabel. Um, this is what, you know, not everyone's going to be uh, interested in that amount of information, but I think it's definitely, you know, more and more people want to know where the food and fibre comes from and the person, personal story behind it, so. I suppose most of it's been covered off, but I, I think I live in Darlinghurst. I'm originally from a sheep and cattle station in, in Queensland and typically, you know, people two generations ago would have a country cousin and they could, if they lived in the city, they'd go out and visit those cousins and have an appreciation of where their food and fibre came from. We're seeing a lot more um, disconnect between rural and regional Australia and urban areas, but I don't necessarily think the divide is a bad thing um, and I don't think it's as from a negative perspective. People go into supermarkets and they'll want to understand where the food comes from and they'll ask questions whether it's genetically modified, is it... Um, safe, is it um, animal friendly, those types of things. And I don't think it comes from a negative point of view, it's just a genuine interest. I, you know, very fortunate, I get to interact with people from the grain sector and broader ag and hear the passion for producing food. And then I go to a barbecue in Sydney and yeah, there might be more vegan sausages on the barbecue, but ultimately there's interest and people are more willing to talk to me, someone that works in agriculture, than my boyfriend who works in the tolls industry um, because people don't like tolls but they generally like farmers. So I think agriculture has an epic story to tell but also recognising that intrigue doesn't come from a place of malice um, in urban areas. It just might not necessarily be um, a complete understanding and a willingness to learn and engage and maybe feel comfortable in asking silly questions about what is genetically modified, what does that chemical mean, why do you use it? And generally when you explain to people that it make you use less water and it's better for the environment from a drought perspective, there is, people walk away going, okay, I feel like I can connect with that more. It's a hunger for knowledge as well as good food. Thanks very much, that, Amelia. Uh, you mentioned questions. I think it's time that we get our audience a little bit more involved. So, does anyone have a question based on domestic food production, either in Australia or internationally, that they'd like to ask our panellists? Justin will bring the mic around. I believe there's a gentleman up the back, Justin, if you can get to. Thanks, Tim. Uh, this one's for Holly. Woolies have obviously changed their marketing strategy and it's gone towards click and collect and delivery. Do you feel that this move has removed the connection that shoppers would have with their products um, and put more pressure on organisations like uh, Sam's talking about to create that connection or how are you guys managing that? Thanks for the question. Um, it's a good one. So our, the demand for online um, delivery, for delivery and for pickup has just you know, ex climbed from COVID. Um, and I think the 
what we try to do is offer all options, right? So um, while that has increased um, from, for some customers, other customers and a vast majority of customers still want to come in and shop and, and do all that. I think, um, I think in terms of um, how, we're, how we're managing it, it's funny, uh, when, when you work for Woolies, you go into store and you do a lot of store time on, and, um, and work, work behind the counter and, and picking stuff. And so one of the days I was actually a, an online picker. So um, all the people that buy online, there's someone behind the scenes who actually does pick all that food. And um, we most often, um, you know, we find that mums are often the best, the best because they know what they're going to get fr um, in, their, in their basket. They want to make sure that other, other families get the same thing. And so we do, we do feel that that connection is still there. Um, and, and through our online stuff, we do have, you know, feedback forms, that sort of stuff. It is a very popular system. I think it's very good for families who might be coming into town, for instance, and just don't want the hassle of taking, you know, a couple of kids into the supermarket and can still come and, and, and pick up and off they go. Yeah. Thanks for that. That was an excellent question and an even better answer. Any other questions for our panellists? Yep, Justin. Uh, we might go down here, Justin, to this gentleman. Raise your hand. Um, so I work on a cattle farm that's working hard on limiting carbon dioxide. This is mainly for, yeah. Um, as a plant grower, do you work on, uh, how do I ask it, like limiting that, like developing food to? Yeah, so I suppose in terms of the grains industry, um, the big thing is we don't necessarily know um, a full picture of how much we're contributing uh, in terms of carbon into the environment. So that's some work that's underway by the Grains Research and Development Corporation to understand where do we sit and then how do we actually move forward in terms of reducing that. Now, no-till as a practice um, really saw a big step change in the 80s um, in terms of ensuring that we've got better environmental impact. Um, now, moving forward, ways in which we can reduce our environmental footprint is ways to rotate crops, and there's a significant amount of research that's going underway in that area. Now, it's not necessarily my area of expertise, but we're looking at um, opportunities to not necessarily offset, but ways that the supply chain can also reduce carbon as well. So, when you grow grain on farm, you put it in a truck generally uh, and transport that through the supply chain and how does that also reduce its carbon footprint. The beef industry is doing interesting pieces when it comes to methane um, with cattle and how you can potentially use algae as a um, feed source as part of that rotation which can stop cows belching and doing the other thing down the other end. Um, so there's some really epic research that is underway and producers pay for that through their levies as well. So that's the other impressive thing to note that um, as an industry, farmers are funding this research. It's not government, it's not necessarily private enterprise. Um, farmers through their hard earned work are funding those research streams as well. Thanks, Amelia. Uh, wonder, Daryl, do you have any comments on the environmental impact that the type of systems you're talking about, the benefits they could be providing there? Yeah, absolutely. So each year we produce an uh, impact report, which is uh, which is basically put together by a third party social market research firm, which seeks to quantify and qualify the outcomes that are being achieved by the collective urban farming network, if you will. So uh, we at the minute we have it's about I think it's about eight hundred thousand square meters under cultivation in urban areas across the country which are diverting somewhere around, I think it's about just over 5,000 kilograms of food waste, which is being diverted each week. And there's, there's all sorts of other metrics um, around uh, community connection. So people that start growing food generally, uh, what you find, and anyone who does grow their own will know this, but at certain times in the year, you just have too much of one type of produce. And it's sort of like, I don't need that much kale, and probably Holly doesn't either. But, um, you know, I can absolutely share it with her and I can share it with other people around me and, um, and, and that's a great outcome. But there's also, uh, so there's this community connection and then there's a, a sequestering of carbon, which is, is really fantastic. And 
anyone that's involved in, I guess, growing plants will know that, you know, the nitrogen fixing elements of plants can be really helpful for the environment and, and help offsetting climate change. So I feel like further to Sam's comment before about, you know, there's more and more people moving back to the land and, you know, even if you're not moving back to the land, we can all be custodians of our planet and our communities and um, we've all got a responsibility to, to, to sort of do the right thing in that regard. Thanks very much, Daryl. I think we've got time for one more question. Yep, Justin. Hi, um, so I actually work in grains research. Um, my research is on increasing nitrogen use efficiency in maize and barley at the moment. Um, but I've worked in grains research and uh, like, I guess for me, I've realized that there has been all of these really good improvements over the years. Um, so for example, with cotton, it's actually 50% more water use efficient now from breeding programs. Um, but I guess like what Sam was saying is that there's so much of this waste. Do you think that for sustainable agriculture that actually overproduction is kind of the bottleneck at the moment? Because I, for me, I think that um, there's a lot of research into increasing production efficiency and things like that, but is the post-harvest kind of part that needs to be worked on? Nice one. Um, I'm happy to answer that just from a quite specific point of view. I think waste at any point of the supply chain is a problem, right? We actually know that once a product leaves the, the supermarket shelf, it's that part in the, in the person's fridge that, that is the most problematic. But if we look at the things that we can control and the, what we're talking about today, you look at things like um, the, the rise of the plant-based industry. So we have a, we have a supplier called Kale and Daughters and they develop a lot of plant-based products for us. Now, we, also, we both, Woolworths and, and Cowan Daughters, both buy green beans from Malgawi farms in Queensland, right? So we buy it as a raw product, and those beans that don't make the shelf then get sold or get sold directly to the plant-based industry. So already that farm and that farming um, business has a lot more um, options and channels for their product. So where those beans may have previously not been sold and you know, who knows where they would have gone, they're now being used for other purposes. Not only is that better for food waste, it's also better for our farmers because the more diverse they have, the diversity they have in their supply chain, the better it is for them to grow and all those things. So I think there's a food waste problem at, at all ends, um, but it is, we have to, I guess we can't get overwhelmed by the whole thing. We have to look at the things that we can control. Um, and yeah, that's a good one from us. And I think another um, aspect to, I suppose, the food waste issue is the food security issue and looking beyond... In Australia, we obviously have people who have the inability to purchase food um, for their own needs, but also to our neighbours in the region as well. And so trade is really important for Australia and particularly the grains industry. You know, we're a product that can sit in a silo or a silo bag um, and finding a home for that grain um, is really important. And government has a role to play in that in terms of opening up markets and reducing barriers to ship our grain to Indonesia, to India. Um, there's people in those countries that want the grain, whether it's for feeding livestock or to turn into barley, to, sorry, turn into beer um, and other products. So it, it, there's a, it's a very complex system, but it's also looking at internationally. Food security is a, a massive issue when it comes to the sustainability development goals of the United Nations. and. Um, how Australia plays in that space um, is really going to be an interesting step forward, particularly when we look at um, our goals for the 2030 roadmap for the agricultural industry. We want to reach 100 billion. Um, at the moment, we're at 60. Uh, the grains industry only contributes 15 billion of that, not only, but we want to get to 30 by 2030. So how do we do that? We look for hungry people and hungry cattle and chooks and everything else around the world. Uh, just um, before you say something, Tim, uh, just going back to your question, I think um, overproduction, um, I was thinking about it um, as a few of these other guys were answering. Um, the amount of times I've cooked dinner for two or three people and had a surplus of food, uh, you know, it happens all the time. I think the problem is we live in such a, you know, dynamic industry where one day you wake up and no one wants to eat meat anymore or the next day you wake up and, you know, barley exports gone out the window. So... I think overproduction um, is is an issue, but I think it's you know it's such a complex and dynamic problem. You can't, it, it, you know, what it's like when you you know the shop runs out of the thing that you want to buy. It, it's much much more of a 
bigger problem then. Um, it's just about when we do have an oversupply, what do we do with it and how do we, you know, address the problem that way. So it's my two cents. Thanks, Sam and Amelia. I think while we're on this discussion about Australia's massive production, and as I mentioned earlier, 70% of all production is exported. So maybe with a little bit of reference to the last year or so and looking forward into the future, I'd be interested to hear from our panellists uh, how do you think our Australian domestic food production will continue to impact on the international scale? Well, interesting for the grains industry, uh, um, our largest market for barley, unfortunately, is no longer there, being China, um, and that leaves a huge gap for Australia. Um, but in saying that, there is extreme interest in what we do produce here, um, overseas markets, whether it's Japan in terms of producing uh, wheat for their ramen noodles. Um, there's a lot of long-lived uh, relationships that have been built up with particular countries to ensure that we're producing for their consumer needs. Not every country eats like an Australian. Um, and we know that Australia is very multicultural and we can test that with our own domestic markets in terms of understanding particular preferences. So there is continuous need to look to new emerging markets and understand their needs um, and the barriers that they have for their own production. So if we're shipping raw barley to India, how are they actually then turning that into a feed source for their cattle or how are they actually turning that into beer? And so building those long-term relationships is really important. So we're not just exporting a raw commodity, but as a country we export incredible talent and knowledge um, and agri-tech to help solve a lot of those problems uh, in those countries so that we're building long-lasting relationships, hopefully, so that if um, certain countries decide not to like our product anymore, we have um, other opportunities available too. Thanks, Amelia. Daryl, I wonder if the urban farming that you've been discussing about, how applicable do you think it could be to uh, implement it on the international scale, perhaps in third world countries? It's a really good question, Tim, and I don't think I've got the answer to that right now, but um, we know that there's an absolute need for education and resourcing in a lot of these developing nations, and, you know, perhaps platforms like Grow It Local can play a role in those environments and to assist with um, the challenges they face into the future. In the first instance, we have a, um, a, seed of, a Seeds of Purpose initiative where for every um, member who registers with the platform, um, a thousand seeds is, is contributed to a local school or community group to help them on their journey. So I guess we're, we're sort of starting in our own shores at home, but um, yeah, perhaps maybe one day we'll get there in the future. Thanks for that. Any other comments on international markets? No, you just don't want to beta that. That's fine. Tim, I've got a question. No. Just no, not for oh you. My God. But sitting here, you know, this has been such a big, thought-provoking conversation, and um, so excellent to have such amazing talent on the stage here. But it's such a big, big chat, and I can't help but think that there's something we can all do right now to sort of appreciate where our food comes from and the people that are involved in bringing it to our homes and putting it on our table, and. I th Sam, I'd love to just know what can we all do as part of the, you know, thank a farmer for your next meal? How can we all get involved in, in that great initiative? Uh, that's a great question and I'm glad we talked about this before, Daryl. Uh, no, I think um, one of the, uh, the most interesting things that happened to me coming in to the show was I actually parked out in P5, I got on the bus um, and it was so interesting to see all the young boys and girls go, oh look, there's the horses or, you know, they are, it's so out of their realm. They've never seen it before, you know, maybe on TV and in movies and that sort of thing. But to see it up close and personal, um, I think such a great thing for them. Um, to everyone here that's in the audience today, um, what I'd love to encourage you to do, if you do see someone who looks like they're from the farm, I know a lot of the, the audience actually are, but actually show a bit of interest. Ask a question. So if you go up and see an exhibitor, ask them where they're from. Ask them how long they've been doing it for. Um, because it's amazing how far those sort of questions can go. Uh, showing a bit of interest in someone's work and not having them just tell you about it is a, is a great thing. And um, people always love talking about what they do and, and how they got to be there. So if everyone today could go and ask um, someone from the land one positive question, um, 
you guys can work out what that might be. Um, I think that would make that person's day. So that might be one way we can do that, Daryl. Thanks very much. That's Sam. Uh, in interests of time, that was a really good wrap-up from you. I was just wondering if our panellists had any quick take-home messages they'd like to leave the crowd with. Daryl, would you like to lead? Sure. I think it's just that the message here today is to, for us all to you know, cons be considerate about where our food comes from and all the energy and time and love that goes into producing it. And that um, you know, really it's up to us as all as individuals to drive the change that we want to see in the world. And um, the best way of driving that change is with your wallet. So, yeah. Um, my final bit is um, you can see up here that, that to get food from paddock to plate, it takes a lot of people and a lot of different roles and a lot of different jobs and, and perhaps jobs you didn't think existed. Um, I didn't know that my job existed until I was in it. Um, and so I guess a lot of young people here um, who I'm, I'm guessing are sort of from the agricultural space or thinking about or listening and talking about agriculture, um, open your mind up to the opportunities in ag because, um, you know, our customers want our products, um, the rest of the world want our products. And so to be part of the industry is, is something you'll never regret. So I encourage you to open your eyes. I suppose to, to add to that, um, agriculture doesn't necessarily mean you have to be um, in a paddock, but I'd really encourage um, everyone, if you've got a gap year or an opportunity at the moment, you can't necessarily go overseas unless you want to go to New Zealand. Nothing wrong with New Zealand. But look for some on-farm opportunities. Um, we're having trouble with not necessarily in the grains industry, but in horticulture and sourcing um, the right people to be picking fruit and veggies. And I think um, selfish plug, but if you're a young farmer, um, Future Farmers Network is a great uh, networking opportunity to join a good organisation to connect with people who work across the um, agricultural industry. So whether they're on farm or young agri-professionals living in capital cities, um, it's a good organisation to be part of. Thanks very much for that. So I think we'll wrap it up there. Uh, that concludes our AgriChat session for 2021. Uh, please give a big round of applause to our panellists. We've had Sam Johnston, Holly Bailey, Daryl Nichols and Amelia Shaw. I'm sure if any of you have any future questions about anything our panellists have spoke about or their work, they'll be more than happy to catch up with them afterwards, quickly. Uh, so once again, I'd like to say a massive thank you to the RAS Youth Group for creating such an engaging and thought-provoking discussion, uh, and especially special thanks to the AgriChats team of Andrew, Justin and Jacob. Uh, finally, this session has all been recorded and it'll be rolled out across various social media platforms in due course. Uh, if any audience members have taken photos or wish to continue sharing their views on social media, please use hashtag AgriChats and hashtag Youth in Ag. Thank you everyone so much for coming and participating in today's discussion uh, and please enjoy your remaining time here at the 2021 Sydney Royal Easter Show.